Hey, I'm Christian Bucher, the associate pastor at LFC. I pray that this message encourages you, builds your faith, and gives you perspective to see that God is moving in your life. Enjoy the message. Well, today, I've got a, a whopper for you. Got a good one. Uh, just because of Jesus, that's all. And uh, one day, a school principal received a phone call. How many educators? Yeah, we've got some educators in the house. One day, a school principal received a phone call, and the caller, caller said, Mr. Principal, my son will not be at school today because he is sick. And the principal said, well, who am I speaking to? And the caller said, I am my father. Thank you. I am my father, right? So my question for you today, my question for LFC family today is, who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Go say, say that with me. Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? All right, so raise your hand if you have lied, if you've told a lie in the past 24 hours. Raise your hand. I, oh, we have. All right, um, well, look at everybody who doesn't have their hand in the air, look at them, look at them and give them stink eye because most likely they are lying. Most likely they are lying. You guys are cracking me up. First service did the same thing. Nobody fessed up. But here's the deal. According to research by Jerry Jellison, he's a psychologist at the University of Southern California, the average person lies up to 200 times a day. The average person, y'all are shocked at that. Well, maybe because another study showed that the average person lies up to four times a day. Does that sound better? That sounds better? Now, here's why. Because we don't count certain kinds of lies. That's why it sounds better to us. Because we distort the truth or there's a little untruth there. That's how we get to that 200 mark, I am sure. But up to four times a day. And another study published in the Journal of Basic and Applied Psychology said that 60% of people lie within 10 minutes of meeting someone new. So they're telling lies, right? Things have gotten so bad, you all, that every year on April 30th, it is National Honesty Day. We have created a day, one day a year. Can we not all be truthful in everything that we do? National Honesty Day, mark it on your calendar. And here's the thing, if I'm gonna lie to you, if, 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 if Pastor Lori is tempted to lie, it's going to be because I don't wanna hurt your feelings. I wanna spare your feelings, that's really noble, isn't it? I'm, I'm gonna lie to you because I don't wanna hurt your feelings. Why do we lie? Why do we do it? Well, we lie to protect ourselves. Uh, we lie to keep from getting in trouble. LFC kids, have you ever told a lie so you didn't get in trouble? Yes, sir, thank you for being honest. We have one, two, two honest people, three honest people in this whole church. It's amazing, it's amazing. We lie to make ourselves look better. I mean, for pity's sake, in 1966, the cigarette industry was, uh, they were required to put a warning label on cartons of cigarettes declaring that there was danger to their health. But for 30 years, the cigarette industry, even though that's on their cartons, they have denied, they denied any danger to your health. Why did they do that? Why did they deny it? Uh-huh, money. Somebody knows where I'm going with that. Money motivated them to lie. And it's kind of funny when we talk about lies, especially, you know, those little white ones. We laugh and we giggle. But I want today for us to understand how God feels about lying. We'll go to Proverbs 12, 22, And this is how God feels. Are you ready for this? He hates it. He detests it. The New King or the King James Version, actually, the word detest, it's used, it's an abomination. Lying is an abomination. Say abomination. 
abomination. Lying is an abomination to God. And that word abomination, if you go back to the Hebrew, it relates to things such as idolatry, uh, unjust weights and scales, incest, adultery, child sacrifice, necromancy. And these are things that if you really take time and think about them will make you sick to your stomach. It is an abomination to God. Lying stirs up the same heavenly anger as those things. It's just as bad as those things. And God talks to us about it in the Old Testament and he talks about it in the New Testament. So all throughout scripture, he deals with lying. And Paul in the book of Ephesians, he says to us, stop it, stop it. Stop lying because when we come to know Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, we are a new creation. Those old things have passed away. We take off the old self and we put on the new self, which is the image of God. We want to be like Christ. We want to be like God in righteousness and in holiness. And when we ask Jesus into our hearts, we become the children of God. Who's your daddy? Oh, you, you guys are good. That's right. God becomes our father and he does not want us to lie. He detests it. He hates lying lips. But on the other hand, the rest of Proverbs 12, 22 says this, but he delights in those who tell the truth. That word delight, if you study that out, it means he favors. How many of you would like the favor of God on your life? Yeah, yes, tell the truth, tell the truth. He has good will towards those who tell the truth. He desires those who tell the truth. How would you like that? Because you're living a truthful life and you're not telling lies. The Bible is saying in Proverbs that God actually desires you. He desires to give you favor. He desires to have goodwill towards you simply by walking in the truth. So when I live that honest life, that's how he feels about me. He feels about me the way I feel about my grandbabies. Imagine that. I delight in my babies. How many grandparents, right? You know, it's delightful. We desire their presence. I could see them one day. And if I don't see them the next day, I'm like, I'm I'm checking out what they're doing, where they're going. Can I get a FaceTime? Can I get a picture? I delight and I desire to be in their presence. But cowards unbelievers, the corrupt murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. This is where we get the saying, liar, liar, pants on fire. That's where it all started. No, it didn't. That was in Revelation. It actually started in Genesis. In the very beginning, when the serpent, who is the devil, the serpent said to the woman, you will surely not die. That's what he said. You'll surely not die. And he deceived her. And what did she do? She took of the fruit and she ate it and everything started to fall apart. Everything changed because sin and death entered the world. Why? Because they couldn't hold on to the truth. They couldn't hold on to the truth that God had given them. And they instead believed a lie. And the devil has not stopped lying ever since. He just keeps going on and on. But here's what stopped me in my tracks this week as I as I studied this and I prayed about it. So you know that there's all kinds of stuff out there. There's all kinds of stuff out there about 
believing the lies of the enemy. We, we, we fall for them, don't we? Like we fall like Eve did, good grief. She was in paradise, right? She had it all going for her. She was taking a walk with Jesus every evening and she fell for it. If Eve fell for it, we probably are gonna fall for it too. And we do. And he lies to us and he says things like, you're unworthy. He says things like, if you're not happy, then God must not love you. He persuades me that I'm alone and I'm the only person who's ever gone through anything like this. I'm not good at praying. The enemy lies and says, you can't give because you don't have enough. He says, the Bible is really boring and it's way too hard for you to understand. It's not worth you reading. He lies and says, once I have a boyfriend, once I have a girlfriend, once I get married, I will finally be complete. Right now, the enemy is saying to the world, love is love. If nobody knows about it, it won't hurt them. It won't hurt anybody else. And so you know what we do? We read. Don't we read. How many of you? Yep, yeah, you read and you read Joyce Myers, The Battlefield of the Mind. Anybody? Yeah, it's a great book. It's excellent. I suggest you read it. Uh, Stephen Furtick, Crash the Chatterbox. Anyone? Oh, amazing book on self-talk. Craig Rochelle just wrote one, Winning the War in Your Mind. I can't wait to read it. I look forward to it. Lou Giglio, he uh, wrote, Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table. It's an excellent book on the mind and believing the lies of the enemy. Ladies, we're going to do in the fall, midweek, Jenny Allen, Get Out of Your Head is what it's called. It's a study on not believing the lies of the enemy. I can't wait. I hope you'll come. But what if, here's what happened this week. I thought, what if? What if not only we don't believe the lies of the enemy, but what if when he started to speak, the enemy, the liar, the one whose native tongue is lying, the father of lies, what if when he started to speak his native tongue that we couldn't even recognize his language? What if we didn't even understand or comprehend what he was saying? So when I was in Tanzania, we um, traveled deep into the bush. And in Tanzania, kind of the language they speak is Swahili. Mm, anybody speak Swahili here? Yeah, me either. And then to make things worse, once you get from into the, into the bush, it goes from Swahili to Datuk, and my mind is blown. As a matter of fact, they start speaking the language, and they're going back and forth, and the missionaries are talking, and you know what happened to me? There might be others of you like this. <laughs> my mind started wondering. I couldn't understand what they were saying. <laughs> I couldn't comprehend what they were saying. And so I just started thinking about Pizza Hut and Mexican food and ice cream because I could not understand anything that they were saying. Nothing, nothing. And for some reason, I was chosen to speak at a school of children um, and I don't know, there's like three or 400 kids there. So pressure's on, right? And I had an interpreter, so imagine that. And I decided that I was going to pull out a sermon that I spoke to our youth a couple years back. And it's called save your drama for your mama. That's a good title. I mean, cause how many of you know that drama transcends location and culture, you know, that adolescent, that teenage drama, it kind of crosses all boundaries, but here's the deal. Isn't that a great title? Save your drama for your mama. Yeah, that's good. It doesn't translate the same way in Swahili. It doesn't have the ring to it. It doesn't rhyme. And so literally my poor interpreter, she, I'm not kidding, took eight minutes to describe what drama is. There's not even a word in Swahili for drama. So we had to go and lay down the print. My whole message, save your drama for your mama. It just wasn't the same. Are you following me here? What if we could not even understand the native tongue of the enemy? What if we couldn't even understand it? 
Grab your Bibles and look in John. We're going to go to the chapter uh, 8 of John and look at 31 through 44. We're going we're gonna to kind of dissect this passage, but you'll find that we are in a group of people and they are, they're fussing about whose children they are, who's your daddy, right? They're fussing, they're trying to determine who belongs to who. And verse 31, listen, to the Jews who had believed in him. To the Jews who had believed in him. You know what that means? They believed in him. They said, we believe in Jesus. These are the Jews who said, we believe in Jesus. And so he's talking to them right now. And he says, if you will hold on to my teaching, if you will, if you will get a hold of my teaching and you'll live by it and you'll continue in it. And when hardships come, we just sang about that this morning. When hardships come and the wind blows, we'll put our faith in Jesus on the Christ, the solid rock I stand. If you will hold on to my teaching, then you really are my disciples. I can almost just hear Jesus saying, you really are my disciples. Like you really are my people. You really are LFC. You really are my family. And Jesus is saying, Hey man, you're for real. It's for real. When you hold on to my teaching, like for reals, you're my disciples. It's not just because you say you are. It's not just because you show up to church. It's not just because your grandma went to church. It's because you really are my disciples. And then he says this, then holding on to the word, you're his disciple, then you will know the truth. You're gonna know the truth. You're gonna recognize the truth. You're gonna be able to discern what is not the truth because you're gonna know the truth and you're gonna speak the truth. You're gonna live the truth. And what happens? The truth will set you free. And there's nothing like that freedom, is there? There's nothing like freedom in Jesus. Money can't buy it, status can't obtain it, and no works can earn it. Nothing can match the freedom in Jesus. And in this passage, though, Jesus is confronting them. And guess what? Guess what? They got offended. The Jews who believed in Jesus got offended at Jesus. Verse 33 says, they answered him and said, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Abraham's our father. We're in the line of Abraham. Who do you think you are, Jesus? You can't judge us. You know that whole you can't judge me thing? It's been around for a long time. So much so that the Jews who believed in Jesus said to Jesus, you can't judge me. Who do you think that you are? And so Jesus says, well, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Um, if you really are children of Abraham, then you wouldn't be trying to kill me. I don't think Father Abraham would be very pleased with what is going on here. And so you know what they did? They changed their mind. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. True. So really, God is our father. That's what they said. God is our father. Who's your daddy? God is, you can't judge us now because God is our father. Look at the verse. Look at verse 42. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. You would love me. He's the one who sent me anyway. Verse 43, why? Is my language not clear to you? Why is my language not clear to you? Jesus is saying to the Jews that believed in him, why is my language not clear? And he goes on to say, because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. 
He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet, because I tell the truth, Jesus is saying, because I tell the truth, you don't believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? I almost can see Jesus like, maybe a little frustrated with these people. Maybe, maybe hurt in his spirit. He's the one who came, he spoke truth, he sat with them and he taught them in the temple and he's saying, I am telling the truth. Why don't you believe me? Why church do we not believe Jesus when his promises are yes and amen? Why don't we believe Jesus when he says, I promise you joy, I promise you rest, I promise you a hope and a future, I promise you every spiritual blessing. I promise you peace. I promise you trials. But in those trials, I will never leave you or forsake you. Why don't we believe Jesus and yet we give ear to the father of lies and we will listen to what he says over what Jesus says to us. It's what happened in the book of John. And Jesus answered his own question in verse 47. He said, whoever belongs to God, hears what God says. He hears his promises. He believes them. He takes hold of the teaching. Remember, takes hold. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. It is strong. That's a strong word. Why? Why the hard stance? Why did Jesus come down so hard on this, on this subject? I think it's because dishonesty is absolutely contrary to the character of God. It's absolutely contrary. See, it's not that God won't lie or that he woke up this morning and said, you know what, today, it, oh, it's April 30th, it's National Honesty Day. I'm not, I'm choosing not to lie today. It's not that, it's that he cannot lie. God cannot lie. A dog can't fly and a bird can't bark. And somebody said, and a man can't get pregnant. Somebody said that. But God cannot lie. He can't do it. When he makes a covenant, he keeps it. When he makes a statement, he means it. When he proclaims truth, we can believe it. Because when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And I think that's why God hates lying so much. Because our enemy, he knows. He knows that it is the truth that sets us free. And so he does all that he can to fill our minds and our lives, lives with lies so that he can take us out of the freedom. The freedom that happens when we walk in truth. It's his native tongue. It's all he knows what to say, how to say. And if he can get you to do the same thing, if he can get you to speak his language. So kids, when your mom says, hey, did you get your homework done? And you say, I don't have any. I, no, not one teacher assigned me homework today. Can you believe it? I don't have homework. You're telling a lie. You are speaking the native language of the devil. When dad says, hey, who's that boy you're talking to? Is that, is that your boyfriend? And you say, he's not my boyfriend. He's not my boyfriend. We're just friends. <laughs> yep. Or how about this one? I never text and drive. Oh, y'all, right. I never text and drive. These are lies. These are non-truths. This isn't being honest. Or you say, uh, uh, I was at my friend's house. I wasn't there. I was at my friend's house. What are you doing on your game? What are you doing on your phone? I'm just playing a game. Have you ever done that? I'm just playing a game. No big deal. We lie. We lie. That's how we get those 200 lies a day. We lie over little, insignificant things. And then we lie to ourselves. 
And then we lie to start rationalizing our lies. And then we lie to cover up a lie that we lied and we can't remember what we lied over here. So we lied over there. And before we know it, we're living a life of deceit and of manipulation. And we convince ourselves that our sin is not that big of a deal. Because maybe it was a necessary evil. I didn't want to hurt your feelings when you asked me if I liked your new shoes. I know, right? It doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal, but is it a truth or a non-truth? If we're not telling the truth, what are we doing? We're telling a lie. And it happens with those itty bitty little things. It happens often when we're kids. So when we were kids, some of you will remember this. Do you remember? If you crossed your finger, who's with me? You remember? If you crossed your finger and what did you do? You put it behind your back. Yeah. You could tell any lie you wanted. You could lie until you're blue in the face as long as your fingers were crossed. And we would like twist our friends around because we wanted to see, you know, are your fingers crossed? And it starts at early ages. But I'm just not picking on the youth group here. I'm not just picking on LFC kids. Because the fact of the matter is, if we look at Abraham in the Bible, Father Abraham, we look at him and Sarah, he lied not once, but twice about Sarah not being his wife. He said, she's my sister. She's not my wife. Ooh, I know, that's gross. He lied in Genesis 12 and again in chapter 20. But here's the thing. Scholars estimate that the first time he told a lie, that lie in particular, that he was probably about 60 to 70 years old. How many 60 to 70 years old do we have in the house today? Don't, you don't have to lie about your age. Hey, dude, are you seriously 60 to 70 years old? You look great for your age, man. Anybody? Okay, that also means you get to go to Breakfast Club with us in a couple weeks if you saw the announcement, Breakfast Club. Now, here's the deal. So when we study out Abraham and Sarah, the second time he lied about her being Um, His sister was about 20 to 25 years later. So he lied the first time when he was 60 to 70. That makes him lying again when he was 85 to 95 years old. Listen, age does not automatically sanctify us. It does not automatically sanctify us unless we yield to the Holy Spirit, unless we, re- we repent and change our ways. In old age, we will duplicate patterns. Pastor's been talking about patterns. We will duplicate patterns that we had in our younger lives. So Abraham, he was convinced, right? He really believed Twice. That if he lied about his wife, that, that that lie would protect them because Sarah was beautiful. She was beautiful and he was concerned that um, the Pharaoh would want her as a wife and then kill him. So that makes sense, doesn't it? Like that makes sense that he would lie so he wasn't killed. That's, that's a good reason he thought, to tell a lie. And you know what happened? It happened. The princess saw how beautiful Sarah was and they went to Pharaoh and said, she's beautiful. You got to take her as your wife. And he did. And then you know what happened? Because Abram lied, remember? He lied. Well, here's what happened. Pharaoh gave him sheep and oxen and donkeys and male and female servants and camels His lie was totally paying off. That's what it looks like, doesn't it? That sounds pretty good. But here's what happened. The Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abraham and said, what is it that you've done to me? Pharaoh wasn't the one who lied. It was Abram. Before his name was changed to Abraham, it was Abram and he lied 
And Pharaoh said, what is this that you have done to me? There are plagues on my household. And let me warn you, church, that when you tell a lie, the Holy Spirit says, what is it that you have done to me? He is grieved when we lie. The Bible tells us in Ephesians, do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by the way that you live. Don't do it. Remember, he has identified you as his own. Who's your daddy? He has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved until the day of redemption. But you, when you lie, you grieve him and you deceive yourself and you're living apart from God's truth and the enemy has you speaking his native language. He's the father of lies. There's no truth in him. And if he can convince you at any age, if he can convince you to lie, even in your own life, he can convince you to lie to others. He can convince you to lie to your neighbor. He can convince you to lie in a business transaction. He can convince you to lie to your, to your teachers at school, to your professors in college, to your coaches. If you lie in, at all, then he'll get you to lie to others others. And he's going to take you away from the truth of God's word. And he starts early. It's a strategy from the very beginning, from the time they're little. Did you take that cookie? Have you seen that little test they do with kids about not eating the cookie or the treats and they time them and these poor kids, it's like torture. Did you, did you take a bite? No. And they've got crumbs all over their face. (laughs) You know, it starts early when, when, Christian was little. He spent the weekend with my parents and a new movie had come out. We were big. We loved movies because we didn't do a whole lot of real TV. And um, it was Pinocchio. They had redone the movie Pinocchio. Uh, He was so cute and so little. He couldn't say Pinocchio and he called it Rokoro. Isn't that sweet? Rokoro. And it impacted him greatly. It impacted his life. And I used it to my advantage any good parent would do. And I, if I would catch him on what I thought would be a lie, I would say to him, Christian, your nose is growing, which was a lie. (laughs) Oh, I would say, Christian, your nose is growing. And if he were telling a lie, he would, he would like, you know, touch his nose to see if it were growing. How many other moms use this technique? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And, and if he was telling the truth, though, and I would say, Christian, your nose is growing, he would say, no, mommy, mommy, I am not lying. And I was convinced because he wasn't, you know, touching his nose, but the enemy starts young. He starts early in life. And if you lie about anything, about silly things, before you know it, he's going to get you to lie to yourself. And then he's going to, which this is his end game. This is the enemy's end game. He is going to get you to live a lie. That's what he wants. That's what he wants from you. That's what he wants from me. He wants me to live a lie, to claim that you are one thing, but really you're something different. So you make great grades in school. You are on the honor roll. You ace every test. But the fact of the matter is you're pulling the cheat sheet down from the internet or you're getting a friend to pass along all the answers. Or maybe you're known in the business realm as Mr. Christian to everybody and business, but behind the scenes, you're a raging alcoholic or you're a verbal abuser to your children and to your family. How about those of you who are on Instagram and you present yourself and, oh, your modern farmhouse decor is on a point. It's beautiful. All your kids match. I love it. Actually, I do love it. But on Instagram, all your kids match. You vacation in the most wonderful places. But the reality is that you are anxious and you're full of fear and depression and you feel alone and insignificant. Living a lie. Maybe really life isn't that bad. Here's the flip side. Things really aren't that bad. As a matter of fact, life's pretty good for you, but you so need attention you so desire someone to say something that you post how horrible 
things are, every pain, every ache, every disappointment goes right up on the world wide web. Maybe your marriage looks perfect. It looks so good. You play the part so well, but the fact of the matter is you don't even share the same bed anymore. You're just living a lie. And that's uncomfortable. Those are uncomfortable statements. But that little uncomfortable feeling that you're sensing in your heart, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Can you let him do what he needs to do in your life today? Consider what he's trying to say. And here's the thing, if that's not weighty enough, like if you don't feel like you've got a two-ton boulder sitting on your chest, I have to tell you that one of my greatest fears as a pastor, as as a pastor's wife, as the mama bear at LFC. One of the greatest fears pastors has, leadership has, our youth leads have, Pastor Lena, one of the greatest fears that we have is that you have deceived yourself into believing that God is your father, that you're a Christian, that you're a Christ follower, when you really may not be one at all. And hopefully there's not many here today like that, but I can almost guarantee you that there's at least one, but probably more. They've fallen for it. You go to church once in a while and you're definitely not a Buddhist. So that makes you a Christian. You live in America for pity's sake. Everybody's Christians in America, didn't you know that? Like if you live in America, you're a Christian, you're a good person. You're good, you're nice, you're nice to people. You do not cheat on your taxes. You are a good American citizen paying your taxes. But when we really look, when you really look at your life, there's no spiritual fruit. There's nothing that makes you different from the world. I mean, you might wear a cross around your neck and possibly you have a Jesus is my homeboy t-shirt. When Jesus speaks the truth or when truth is spoken, you don't even hear it. Actually, you may hear it, but Jesus or his truth spoken offends you. Go back to the the passage in John chapter eight that we just read. Jesus offended those that believed in him. And they said to Jesus, why are you judging me? You can't judge me. Who do you think you are? It happens up in the church. Let's look at 1 John 2, 4. It says, if, in, if someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. We are speaking the language of Satan himself. When we are liars, we're speaking the devil's native tongue. These lies, they bring bondage. They bring bondage. But the truth, the truth brings freedom. Satan wants us to tell a lie. He wants us to believe the lie. And he ultimately wants us to live the lie. But Jesus wants us to hear the truth. He wants us to experience and walk in the truth. And he wants us to truly be set free. That's what Jesus wants for us. That's the voice of truth. That is something to be excited about. That is good news for you today. And God has a remedy for your sin. God has a remedy for your lies. And the first thing is to confess to God. Confess, repent. If we confess our sins, 1 John says, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Jesus will forgive you. There's no lie too big. There's no sin too great that Jesus will not forgive you if you ask him to. And he purifies us and we can start to stand straight. We can start to walk a straight line because God and his truth is in us. 
That's something to, to, to be excited about. Because of Jesus, because of him, his blood, we are washed white as snow. God doesn't go, oh, there's that liar. That's not what he does. When you ask forgiveness and you repent of your sin, he said, there's my kid. I delight, I delight in him. He's a truth teller. I favor him. He walks in honesty. I wanna be in his presence because I delight in those who tell the truth. So you confess to God. The second thing of God's remedy is confess to others. Mm. Ooh, listen. Now this one will just kinda, I don't know, let it sit with you for a minute. James tells us this, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now, hold on a minute. It says to confess your sins to each other. I would suggest that you confess your sin to the one you sinned against. Did you lie to your spouse? Did you steal something from the job? You would go to your boss, right? So you're gonna confess to each other or you will confess to uh, in a safe environment, maybe a pastor, maybe a counselor where you would confess your sin. I do not suggest that you confess your sins for the whole world to know. Here's the thing. If that point comes where there is a, a, a world knowing of your sin, it's because when God tried to get you to bring it to light, you wouldn't. Yeah, yeah he'll do it. He'll do it in private for a very long time. He has such grace and mercy for us that he will, he will get you and want you and desires for you to deal with things on a very personal, intimate level. Uh, but if not, and you continuing, God loves you so much that he might bring it all to light. Yeah. All right, confess your sins to each other and pray, why? So you may be healed. So you may be healed. You confess to God and he forgives your sins. But when we confess to others, healing takes place. If in your marriage you've had a struggle and you've confessed to one another, healing can take place. Are things bad? Maybe, maybe you might want to check if you are sick. I'm not saying everybody who's sick has, sick has unconfessed sin. That's not what I'm saying. But if you are, we make it a habit to say, God, if there's anything in me that it's messing up this system of mine, then will you help me to get it right before you? Because James says, if we confess to each other, we will be healed. Is your business not doing how you want your business to do? Well, maybe you ought to check your business practices. Are there some things you need to get lined up with God's word and the truth of his word? And if you confess, if you ask forgiveness of God, he'll forgive. And if you confess to those wronged or the one that you've maybe done something to, the Bible says you will be healed. Your business can be healed. It's amazing what happens when we follow the truth of God's word. As we close, I want to give you a quick illustration of the power of confession. We had uh, some great kids in our youth group over the years. We were youth pastors for eight years. And there at our first church was some kids. I changed their names. I'm not lying to you, but you know, I changed their names on purpose. We'll call them Tanya and Matt. They grew up in our youth in... Um, Eventually, Matt became a youth pastor. Like he's called into ministry, like these kids were called into ministry at camp. And he became the youth pastor, and he started dating Tanya. And um, they got engaged, and sadly, they crossed some lines, pretty significant lines. And um, they were intimate before they got married. And they decided to keep that a secret because they're afraid of what would happen. Well, years went by and their marriage struggled. It literally struggled from the very beginning. And things got so bad that Tanya decided she could not live that way any longer. And she packed up their little guy. And one day when Matt was at work, she left and took the little guy with her. Things had gotten so, so, so bad. 
And by that time, they had moved across the country, and she packed him up and moved all the way back home. Can you imagine how Matt felt when he got home and they were gone? He didn't know where they were. Come to find out, she had taken their son, moved back with family. Oh, can you just start imagining the dynamics to all of that? And so Matt didn't feel like there was any hope and he filed for divorce. Now fast forward to all that stuff that goes on in between. And it was the day before the, the divorce, it was a Friday. And Matt's mom got a hold of us, got a hold and said, would you please pray today's, uh, the kids are going to get divorced. It's done. There's no hope for them. And pastor and I talked about it and we thought, well, maybe, maybe we can talk to him. And pastor reached out to Matt and I think he was traveling, I think. And I reached out to Tanya and I met her for lunch and we talked and he talked by phone to Matt and we convinced them, would you give us, just give us a chance. We just want to talk to you guys. They did not get to our home until midnight that night. And we talked and we prayed and we asked God for wisdom for hours through the night. And at 3 a.m., both of them finally confessed that they had had premarital sex, but that they were so afraid to tell anybody that their ministry would be ruined, that no one would permit them to serve as youth pastors, that they concealed it for all of those years. And so the very foundation of their marriage was built on this, on this lie but I'm not kidding. When they confessed and, and started to weep before the Lord, they asked forgiveness of God and they confessed their sin to us. God did an amazing work. I kid you not, night and day difference. And that little couple, they went home together and they renewed their vows. They've been married uh, probably 15 years by now. They have two beautiful children. They're Layla in their church and they are living for Jesus. I am talking, they were down to the day of divorce and they confessed their sin and they were healed. That's what the Bible said would happen. And in fact, that is the very thing that happened. It's part of God's remedy. He also would have you read and study the Bible. When we have God's word in our heart, it makes us harder to sin. It just makes it harder harder when we hide his word in our heart and will you ask God to help you and believe that he will help you David he said in Psalms set a guard over my mouth Lord King David said, Lord, set a guard over my mouth and keep watch over the door of my lips and he did God is true to his word